Hey there. Just a heads up that before this podcast starts, it is a very technical episode, but that was inescapable and in many ways on purpose, both to reward our listeners that do have an extensive technical background, and some of them do, and beg for more broken sale cons like the one with Daniel Nenny, but also to give our listeners who do stick through the entire thing an idea of how experienced this guest is and to lay the groundwork for the deeper conversations that come. And so in other words, in this episode, we eventually get to why AMD doesn't manufacture more of its cards on other nodes than TSMC 7 nanometer. For example, uh, the future of Intel, can they go fabulous? The evolution of memory, if Intel 3D X point or Optane is going to succeed or if it's just not been utilized properly. Even fun questions like, how will next-gen consoles be designed? What memory systems will the PlayStation 6 use? So we do get to all of these interesting and fun subjects, but it is a bit technical in the beginning and a few other spotted portions of the podcast. So just a reminder, there are timestamps below. You can skip ahead if you're not interested, but I do think you will be rewarded for sticking through the whole thing, and I don't believe there's any parts of the conversation where we'll get bogged down for more than a few minutes going through some things that may just be over some people's heads, but I don't think they're that much over it, and I think it'd be worth it, and well, I hope the people who look for this type of content enjoy it. Anyways, back to the show. Okay, and welcome to Broken Silicon, a typically gaming hardware podcast. I'm your host, Tom, and today, just right out of the gate, I will let my guest introduce himself. I am Dave Eggleston, and I'm an independent consultant uh, in the storage and memory industry, and I have over 30 years of experience in this exciting industry, so looking forward to talking about memory and storage with you today, Tom. You know, when people say they have insert this many years of experience, I think sometimes experience may be more bolded, underlined in a bigger font. When I was looking through your history, it is, this is quite very much so (laughs) a long list of um, pretty remarkable experience, actually. I'm not even... Well, I'm not even sure where to start. I think I think I'll just start where I usually do with a guest such as yourself. Uh, um, what even you know? Where are you from? What got you sure. into what you got into? Yeah, I'm from upstate New York, and if you know upstate New York at all, I was right in the middle of the state in the uh, Binghamton, Endicott, Vestal area, which might ring a bell for some people who have experience with IBM because my grandfather worked for IBM in the original lab, actually, even before it was IBM, it was international time recording. And Hmm. he was a mechanical engineer there and uh, would invent at that time for what became IBM. Uh, My father also worked at IBM right there in the IBM Endicott plant. And he focused on uh, printed circuit board technology. Uh, So he also came at it as a mechanical engineer. And so we have engineering running in the family, and uh, but I went away from upstate New York and went to school down in a little more balmy North Carolina at Duke University for my undergrad and went to the engineering school there. And part of the reason I did that is I wanted to do take electrical engineering, but I wanted to do it in a full university environment. And so my dad was a little appalled when I turned down MIT uh, to go to Duke. <laughs> He said, well, you got to go watch basketball. And yes, I still watch Duke basketball, but, uh, but I found that was a great fit for me because I am always very interested in technology, but I'm also interested in kind of the broader issues around technology and using it and as how we interact with it as human beings. So I'd say I like that opportunity to get a little more broad based. Yeah. And I mean, that's good to know, you know, right at the beginning here. And we spoke a little bit offline before recording this. Uh, something that is immediately apparent to me is 
that you really are, well, I don't know, tell me if I'm if I'm describing you in a way you think is wrong, but very much you see the big picture in addition to the individual designs, right? Well, hopefully I, I do. I think with respect to memory and memory and, and memory as used as storage, where I've spent an awful lot of my career, um, I'll just give you an example. I think, you know, worked at Micron for a dozen years and I found a lot of the memory engineers We'll kind of stay in that little bubble and only think about the memory bit cell and maybe mm-hmm. the design. And I constantly say, hey, memory hooks up to a processor somehow. Do you know how that works? You know, how, how does the processor use it? And, and I've always tried to look at it from that point of view. And then um, a little bit prior in my career, I'd been in very early at SanDisk, and that was tremendously fun. Probably the most fun years of my corporate life. Um, at a little startup at that time and trying out these new concepts of how to use a brand new memory technology and how to hook it up to a system and, and make use of it. So uh, that's always interested me. And I think it's one of the challenges as uh, both memory and storage have continued to grow in their importance in some ways, even holding back computing right now. We need to think about that broader implication of how to use these resources to solve certain problems, you know, what, what's the application need and, and how can we uh, deploy it to, to solve those problems? So, so yes, hopefully I'm thinking about the big picture and um, that's what I do now as a consultant. I advise my clients looking at their strategy and how to apply what they have and grow it going forward. Yeah, I, I think that something that I've seen you know, especially looking at a lot of you know uh, tech commentators like people such as myself on YouTube, an easy mistake to make is actually if you know a lot about a specific subject, it can actually make you make incorrect predictions, right? Because you might know one subject so well that you're well, then this has to be the next thing, right? And you might be missing that just because this thing you know well may work in theory, it doesn't work in practice, especially not with the other thousands of things being designed right now. I, I think you're very spot on with that. And it's I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit because I had a conversation with a, a longtime industry colleague of mine this week uh, where we have the scars of, of trying certain things and saying, oh, this will work and that won't work. But at the same time, you know, we, we have to respect the, the, the newer blood in the industry trying things which we say, no, that can't be done. But hey, we were young ones too, and we were too stupid to know better, and we made stuff work. <laughs> so um, I think you got to keep that balance and, and stay excited about some of the new things coming up and, and not stay in your preconceived ideas too much. That's, that's how technology moves forward. Um, some folks taking a risk and trying new things. So before we move into some of the deeper conversations, I'm not even really sure where to start. I'll just kind of go through as much of your history as you want to. I mean, we can, you know, skip past some things if you don't have as much to say, but I mean, you got a a master's in semiconductor physics and IC design, and then you worked as a product engineer at AMD I, in my notes say 85 to 90. I mean, do you, what did you do when you worked at AMD? Is there yeah, anything? That, that was a fantastic experience because the industry actually went through a downturn in, in 87. Mm. And what happened was a lot of the experienced people left AMD at that time. I joined the non-Volta memory group. I turned down the ROM group, which turned out to be a good decision. Uh, so I was working on EEPROMs, UV EEPROMs. Um, which quick side note, uh, you know, as a working with UV light before with with COVID life here now, I set up UV ovens in my garage and uh, to disinfect things mm-hmm. uh, to to try and do that. But anyways, you know, NVM was just emerging. I mean, it was UV problems were used in place of ROM. Um, it was pretty clumsy technology. We just kind of dove in and ran things our own way. Uh, so it was, I think, much more rapid learning than I might have received at a, a larger company. Let me move on then. So then you also worked at SanDisk, which is a yes, company most people listening to this will have probably heard of from 1990 to 93. What did you do there? I did a crazy thing. I, I had, was aware of uh, Dr. Eli Harari uh, starting a new company. I knew of him from his prior company, Wafer Scale Integration, mm-hmm. where he was literally trying to do uh, full compute on a wafer. 
And I thought, what is this thing? Um, well, it has to do with non-volatile memory. So I joined them as their very first product engineer. My employee number there was 32. And we went and uh, you know, developed some, some things that were brand new in the industry. It was basically how to put non-volatile memory behind this controller to make it look like a disk drive. And uh, there were some, some tricks we learned along the way. There was obviously some important IP that got developed. Mm-hmm. That, that Sandus developed, but uh, super, super fun uh, to work in that environment. And uh, like I had mentioned a few minutes ago, probably the, the most fun in my corporate life I ever had because of the new ideas. So, very bright people, um, just a handful of people and trying. Not to anymore. Sandus, no. Because quite a get bit bigger than what yeah. I think you told me earlier, looking at how many employees they have in 2021. <laughs> I used to have when uh, when I was there. I used to have the employee phone list, which was fit on one side of a sheet of paper, and it included things like conference room, you know, because we only had one. Yeah. Um, and then our lab, just a quick side story. Our lab was in. Uh, it was an old stockbroker's office, and our lab was behind a, a certain wall, and all our equipment would cause everything to overheat. So we were constantly trying to jack up the AC, which ran up the electric bill. So. Uh, so those were good times. Okay. And so the next, you were the director of systems engineering at Micron from 95 to 2007. And I do think we have a few Micron questions later in the discussion. Great. But I mean, so what does that mean, director of systems engineering? Sure. So I took that uh, non volatile memory experience. Again, AMD, I worked directly with the fab um, at, at SanDisk. It was developing these system concepts, although I was working on the memory. And then I moved to the controller side and, uh, you know, did, helped um, help with designing the controllers, the memory controller that we would use uh, within flash cards. Initially, Compact Flash was the first product we launched at Micron and doing the controller design, uh, firmware development, et cetera. So at that time, um, a lot of there weren't there weren't really the companies yet that were like a Silicon Motion or a Fizon, which would develop their own controller. Mm-hmm. What was happening was the memory companies themselves, and there are good arguments for it, were developing the controllers specific to their own memory technology. At Micron, we did something that competed with NAND, but with a, a, a NOR flash bit cell. Uh, and so again, that was one of those ideas, so one of those times when we were too stupid to know better. Um, and we just made it work, and we landed some big contracts with Kodak and HP, or two that I remember, and mm-hmm. kind of broke into the market that way on flashcards. It took us, you know, several years. It it took us quite a bit longer than we originally planned. Um, eventually, Micron shifted gears and embraced NAND technology. Uh, did their own technology, homegrown NAND technology, which uh, to this day has has proven to be very successful. Uh, but then Micron converted, like like many in the industry, to buying third-party controllers and, and kind of uh, moved in that direction. So that's when I was interested in looking at other opportunities and, and moved on to there with my former boss from Micron, who had started a small company called Unity Semiconductor. Mm-hmm. And Unity Semiconductor, in a lot of ways, was a research company, materials research company. And we looked at uh, many different types of uh, resistive RAM technology, Mm -hmm. looking for what would come next after NAND flash. And uh, and we had pretty good success at coming up with a test chip and and a lot of IP. Uh, But what happened then, and eventually I was made CEO of that company, stepped into that role. Mm-hmm. Not surprising. Signed a deal with Micron to help develop our technology. We licensed them on the technology. Uh, but 3D NAND came about. And mm-hmm. once 3D NAND came about, which gave the high capacity, then resistive RAM wasn't uh, so useful anymore. And, and in the almost decade since, resistive RAM has kind of floundered as a technology. So I've been... I, I'm quite proud of the work we did there at Unity. Um, Rambus acquired us for the IP and has also spun out into a company called Reliance, spun out that same uh, technology and IP. Uh, but overall, uh, that technology has kind of stumbled where others, uh, what we're going to talk about, 
have moved into the, some of that space. And uh, so that was, that was rather an exciting time to go back and work on physics again and uh, learn different elements in the periodic table that I never knew existed <laughs> and kind of get back into that side of it. So kind of prove to yourself you're still an engineer, in fact, right? Because <laughs> I know what it's like to go from, you know, certain types of work and then yeah. go back to other types of work and go, ah, yeah, I still, I still got it. <laughs> it was very hands-on. Yeah. I'd be in the lab, um, even a CEO probing, collecting data on the HP, you know, analyzer, semiconductor analyzer, that kind of thing. Um, which was again, a, a lot of fun and keeps your learning moving forward, which is, you know, one of the themes I've tried to have throughout my career. And that's going to be I think the majority of this conversation pretty soon is talking about how memories evolved and what the future yeah. of memory will really be. But before we get into the, the last one that I wanted to bring up is if there's any anything you wanted to talk about regarding your work at Global Foundries as well. Sure. They used to be in the news for AMD sure. products. Well, they still are all the time, but a, a lot bit. more a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So um, after Rambus acquired Unity Semiconductor, I stayed on board to integrate the team in. Um, Rambus treated us very well as an acquisition. Uh, but once you've worked for yourself, it's hard to work for somebody else. And so <laughs> yeah, I, it is. <laughs> I spun out and started my uh, consulting business and had a, a very good run of it. And it's continued to this day. Um, I was enticed to go back into industry specifically at Global Foundries to help them build up their embedded memory. I'd never um, worked in the foundry business before, so that was good new learning for me. Um, I think I brought expertise to the company on non volta memory. And then one of the things we tackled was getting MRAM uh, up and running as an embedded memory to su su succeed the embedded flash that exists today. So that was quite a good technical challenge as well as business challenge to get that up and running. And uh, that's been successful. Global Foundries has debuted that on their 22 nanometer FDSOI platform, and they look to extend embedded MRAM going forward. Standalone MRAM has been pretty disappointing as a market. Um, but that did not surprise me, uh, even coming into the job, you know, I kind of redid the business plan. So mm -hmm. the company was really dependent on the embedded memory and not standalone memory. Um, but it, it was good learning for me to learn that whole ecosystem. I saw some questions that you forwarded about FDSOI. I think it's quite a exciting platform. It fills a very interesting space for things like IoT, low power devices, battery powered devices, where you don't need FinFET performance or power hungry. But FDSOI has a, a, a nice area there. And the foundry business here in 2021 is doing great. Oh, yeah. So wait, let, since you bring it sure. up, let me just skip right to that question Thank before you. we continue on with the notes. So yeah, Carbon Cry writes in and says, questions on the fab side. I guess that's, that's what you were talking about first. We'll, we'll go with his second question, actually, before the other one. He's asked, what is the future of global foundries and what role will FDSOI technology have going forward? Could we see it used for bleeding edge nodes as shrinks? and gate structure changes stop bringing enough improvements. And I think this is interesting because it's a few videos I did on Global Foundries. Uh, actually not. Yeah. So I guess not last year. Now it's 2021. I guess in 2019, I did a few YouTube videos talking about how, you know, if you really break it down, Global Foundries 12 nanometer um, uh, node, the new, the one he's referencing, FTSY, yes. is actually closer to like, the early seven nanometers at TSMC and some at design aspects than you'd then you might think by the name. And that I was like, you know, I think there's a real place for this and a lot of products in the future. Although so far, none of them have been gaming products, to be clear. Right. But I, but I do see a point where as no shrinks are less and less of a big leap, that something like what Global Foundry is working on doing so well could, I don't know, really have a great place in the market. But yeah, go on. Sure. Yeah, I think it's a mistake to put, you know, FinFET technology up against FDSOI and compare them and say, who's the winner? I think that's, that's completely the incorrect way to look at it. And uh, the, the person who asked the question has the right take, which is FinFET will keep accelerating going forward and driving down that, uh, very expensive mask set. Look, to tape out a design now 
you know, the mask set alone can be what, $50 million or more design <laughs> yeah. costs for a tape out on top of that. You're talking about a $200 million to $250 million mm. per tape out. That's not affordable for certain products which fit in between. So 28 nanometer is kind of mm -hmm. the last generation of bulk silicon. And then you've got this gap. If I want to go to FinFET, okay, I've got to invest a lot. You know, 14, 16 is okay. And costs have come down. Yeah. But FDSOI is really another branch below 28 nanometer. Mm -hmm. And at 22 FDSOI, like I said, you get some really great things. You get some very low power and man, you can build the best radios in the world on that. Mm -hmm. And so look back at Global Foundries combining with the strengths from IBM. One of the things that IBM rules on, still out of that old Burlington fab up in Burlington, Vermont, is building great radios, the best in the world on SOI. Well, now integrate that with pretty advanced logic, low power logic. And what you have is wireless things that are battery powered. FDSOI is a great technology for that. So it hasn't appeared in the gaming space because gaming in a lot of cases is going to be wall powered. Um, mm -hmm. But look, look at anything 5G radios into millimeter wave, um, automotive. I mean, there's so many places that this goes that are not data center, that are not consumer electronics, but kind of mm -hmm. the in-between wireless battery powered infrastructure. So um, F and FDSOI is not going to be uh, the, the market size of, of FinFET. Um, it's going to be a smaller, more niche market. And this is where Global Foundries has, has really turned to strategically in the last three years because they just can't invest and compete on that treadmill with TSMC and with Samsung. Well, so I guess I have two follow-up questions then regarding Global Foundry is, and, and I don't, and again, I don't know if this is something you, a subject you usually think a lot about. Almost everything I do is related to gaming eventually. Does it surprise you at all that like when you look at AMD manufacturing like RDNA 2 graphics cards, Zen 2, Zen 3, APUs, and consoles, all of them on TSMC, pretty much almost all of them on seven nanometer, besides like, I guess, right, IO dies uh, for Zen 3 now. Does it surprise you at all that they haven't decided to go with something like Global Foundry is 12 nanometer FDX for some low end graphics card so they can split apart the um, capacity? Because I mean, it's Everyone knows that TSMC is in so demand right now. Right. That, like no one can get enough of anything they want. And you know, I, when you look at a high performance graphics card, like you know, quote unquote big Navi or whatever, it's like of course that's going to be on the a cutting edge, no, edge node and it's going to be giant. But when I look at like what would be not like a six hundred millimeter squared card, but like a one fifty millimeter squared, it's like does it need to be clocked at two point five gigahertz? Maybe mm -hmm. this could be one point mm -hmm. five, and it would be almost as dense and efficient as seven nanometer from Global Foundry's newest 12 nanometer. Why not just use that? Does that surprise you? It, no one's doing that? No, it doesn't surprise me. I think that, you know, the two horse race and the arms race, again, we mentioned earlier was with TSMC and Samsung. So if I'm AMD, who am I going to diversify with? I'll look at Samsung on a very similar technology or similar performing technology. Designing for FDSOI is quite right, okay. different than designing for FinFET. It almost takes a different design team with different aptitude. Uh, so it's not an easy port of any mm -hmm. design. It's Again, it's a very good fit for companies that you know, design radios. And you don't you know, think it'd be worth it to like, like, okay, say, hey, we're going to do one branch of this architecture and design a low end thing around that. You just, you don't think it's probably worth the money at all. I don't think so. I think economically you, you wouldn't do that. I think you'd look to a, a Samsung and porting it there. Now, keep in mind, I, I mean, you probably know well that Global Foundries was developing seven nanometer and then mm -hmm. cut it, called it quits. Why? Because when they looked at how much it would cost as a company, um, I remember the R&D budget for seven nanometer was right around a billion dollars a year. That's the R&D budget for yeah, seven I think nanometers. I heard it got up to like five billion eventually to 10 is what they thought it would end up costing at the end of the day. Ultimately, yeah, it was five. It was a billion dollars a year. And you're a four billion dollar year company that's just breaking even at best. No, yeah. you can't afford it. Where's that money going to come from? 
and uh, the lead investor stepped back on that one. So, so no, I think and you look, think they had to, right? Because what I saw from Global Foundries was at least the way they framed it was this is a strategic decision to not continue. And I'm like, well, that's how you might want to say it, but they it's were also kind of, like, yeah, they're kind of backed into it. I think, okay. the, yeah, just without giving too much away of the inside inside baseball there, but uh, the the investor had been very patient with Global Foundries. And as I recall, Mutabala Corporation had put in something like $20 billion over the total life of Global Foundries. And now they were saying, hey, where's our return? When can we start taking money out? And look, when you have that big an R&D budget, and like we said, barely breaking even at best, you can't do it. So you have to look at something strategically different. Um, you you kind of went quickly through the IO die, but that's actually really important to AMD mm-hmm. because IO doesn't scale with the logic. And Not so as much. Not, yeah. It, well, it really doesn't. It's, it's a it's it and it's again we come back to it's economically unfeasible to take mm-hmm. that down into uh, lower generations until they're very mature until the equipment's very depreciated until the wafer cost is there the yield is high so so um, you know one of the things that AMD did that's very smart was this kind of chiplet strategy of splitting off logic from I/O and uh, that's been a very very good strategy. Um, kind of, it's you know we'll, we'll come to it later, but it's kind of the disaggregation strategy inside a chip, and saying that this technology works really well for logic. This technology I can't scale, so I'll use that for I/O, and I'll use assembly techniques to kind of bring it all together. Mm-hmm. Well, and so what I've heard though is that eventually the plan with. Zen 4 is to use TSMC 7 nanometer for the IO die in conjunction with five nanometer chiplets and whatever the heck else they're going to bolt on to this advanced Zen 4 that's probably going to look nothing like Zen 3. Like, do that's you, correct. right? So, but do, so do you see a long term problem for global foundries though, where in the short term they have this advantage, but in the long term, hey, look, seven nanometers better once it matures and they just build more fabs? I, is there a worry Global Foundries could just be pushed out of the market once TSMC just has endless seven nanometer matured nodes? I don't think it's pushed out, out of the market. Keep in mind that in Singapore, you know, Global Foundries has older fabs that are fully depreciated that are highly profitable. Well, sure. So, so you know, what you're talking about is the fab in, in upstate New York and Malta, um, which is really geared for 14, 12 nanometer. And what do they do next is they lose AMD as a customer. Yes, it's a concern. I think the company has you know, been focused on it for years, even in the time mm-hmm. I was there. And what can they do to kind of fill that line? Now, again, the foundry business is great here in 2021. You know, older fabs, middle fabs, newer fabs are all full to over full. Um, we see shortages in appliances. We see shortages in automotive. Um, people just can't get chips. And so that's going to constrain the industry overall. But then wafer pricing is going up. Um, one that your your listeners may be familiar with is a, a guy out of China called Yi Store that just raised their controller pricing 50% uh, mm-hmm. this week. Why? Because their their foundry is telling them, we're raising our prices. So we're going to see that. It's going to slow down the industry with some price increases. Um, so near term, I think Global Foundry is in good shape. Their, their plan is to go public when they can. You know, mm-hmm. that, you know, within one two years has been uh, the statement for a while. Uh, it'd be interesting to see when they do. And uh, the Chips Act that's before Congress is also very interesting because now there's a push to have U.S. domestic manufacturing at a more advanced node, and so that could yeah. turn things. We we could see where the U.S. government decides to invest a couple billion dollars into advanced technology and uh, global foundries with the even the legacy IBM business uh, for the U.S. government and military contractors. You know, we could see more of that push. Uh, And look, they have the room for one more fab right there in in Malta, New York, and maybe that's how that one gets built. And maybe that becomes a, a five nanometer fab. I don't know. We'll see what happens. So I guess... What you're saying, though, is eventually you do think Global Foundries has to push for getting to five and seven nanometer eventually, that they can't always just do this. You know, we're not going to bother going to that. Yeah, they're just out of the arms race. You know, they're not trying to be bleeding edge. Yes. 
They're not out of the arms business, just out of the arms race. Correct. And then, then they fall back and their direct competition is UMC and SMIC. Yeah. So I guess you're probably also saying, is it a concern TSMC could just outrace them and have all of these cheap seven nanometer fabs eventually, but look, there's always concerns, right? And their strategy is the only one that could kind of do to, uh, maybe I'm, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. That's just kind of, we, we, we could have a there. very long discussion about, uh, over concentrating at TSMC, over concentrating in yeah. Taiwan, Taiwan v China. V it is US. a concern of mine. <laughs> There's there, there is that. And we see some open-mindedness now about, uh, especially with U S China friction, um, about over reliance on, on Taiwan or, or Chinese suppliers. So, I think the U.S. semiconductor industry has kind of uh, goes through cycles of being mm-hmm. in favor or out of favor for uh, for government support or at least U.S. domestic support. With TSMC building a fab in Arizona, um, that's an interesting development. You know, mm-hmm. how does that change the dynamic? So, I think the foundry industry is uh, is pretty fascinating, and it's quite different for me from the memory memory business. So, I uh, it's it's a good space to watch. Well, you know, and so let me get to the other question Carbon Cry had here, since we're on the foundry conversation. Um, He asked, can Intel spin off their fabs and can they enter the foundry market at all, really, given that they failed miserably the last time they tried? (laughs) The answer is no, I don't think so. Um, You know, it's it's a bit sad to see Intel, which, look, when I started my career, Intel was bad at manufacturing. They were bad at fab. Um. After about my 10th year anniversary, Intel became very good at fab. And mm-hmm. they were good at fab for, I'd say, the next 15 years. And the last five plus years, they've been bad at fab. And I don't quite know why. But I mean, you turning- think, because uh, when I talk to people about it, I almost just wonder if they neglected it. Like the way I've heard it described to me from some people is that they thought they'd kind of always be ahead. And so there wasn't, you know, some people were ringing alarm bells that there's 10 nanometer issues many years ago and they just never sent the money they needed. They just, you know, maybe we'll just buy McAfee for $7 billion instead of putting that yeah, into fixing our fab. Yeah, that was, that was weird. I get, uh, I'm with you on that. Uh, yeah, Intel made a lot of strange acquisitions, but I think that came on a corp dev. No, I remember going to uh, IDF when Brian Krasanich had just started as CEO. Mm-hmm. And I uh, can't remember what year that was, but was it, was it 20, 2013, 2014? I can't remember, somewhere in there. And it was, we're back in the fab business. We're back. We're Silicon guys, you know? We're, mm. we're back on top of this. Um, it's quite something. And I can't really say why they fell off on ability to push ahead. Um, uh, maybe they got too impressed with their own success, uh, where TSMC, you know, being driven by their customers mm-hmm. had to constantly innovate and move ahead. Right, like Apple. And they always felt like we had this franchise. Now, it's true that their CPU franchise has covered up a lot of sins for a long time, including in their non-volatile memory group. Mm-hmm. Um, but to come back to the question, I think it's incredibly hard. Uh, you know, you, you'd say, oh, the equipment's the same. We can do foundry. Foundry is a very different mindset from being an IDM. Mm-hmm. It takes different people, different ways of thinking. Um, even at Global Foundries, I, I watch the team struggle with that. You know, Singapore, Global Foundry Singapore has 250 customers. Mm-hmm. And, and so they offer a platform that lots of customers can design on. The IP is ready for them. There's lots of tools. Um, and, and so they really have that foundry mindset. And Global Foundries in Malta has kind of struggled because at 14 nanometer FinFET, they had two customers, IBM and AMD, and they weren't really doing enough to put the platform together, put the ecosystem in place for IP to support a broad set of customers. So making that transition is very, very difficult um, because you've gone from making one type of technology in Intel for CPUs to be successful and now saying, hey, now we got to make that technology work for all kinds of customers. That, that mindset, that ecosystem, um, very, very tough. And, and you can't really rely on third parties to do it. You got to do enough of it yourself. So I, I think that is um, not a viable strategy for it. Not that they won't try, 
I was going to say, it so could. the way you're phrasing it, it's almost as if you're saying it's not, I'm not really even saying they should or shouldn't. I'm saying it's not as easy to do as some people. Because I hear a lot of people in like investment firms who like, I'll talk to you sometimes and they're like, oh, I think Intel should spin off their fabs. And you're, you're saying that you can't just do it. You know, like that's not, it's not a flick of switch. And, you know, it, it, I think that view is just, way to, hey, the tools are the same. Yeah, but the people aren't and the ecosystem isn't. And um, look, I've, I've got 30 plus years of making fun of Intel. I have, uh, but I have tremendous respect for them. Uh, but a longstanding maxim in the industry is Intel hates their customers. <laughs> well, in the foundry business, you can't hate your customers, right? Mm-hmm. You, you have to no. service those customers and they complain and they put pressure on you and, and you have to put the right, um, you know, all the way from the sales force down to the uh, the operators, you know, all the way through the engineering ranks. You've got to put the right ecosystem in place. And that looks very different from what Intel has today. So, no, that's not an easy switch to to make. And what was the other question that was involved there? Was there oh, one Oh, the first one? one was actually Global Foundries. Uh, right. So but we what, covered the Intel, that. was there a second point there? Can't remember. I mean, I, I think that was it. Can Intel spin off their fabs? Can they enter the foundry market at all, really? Uh, yeah, the next talking point I have is just honestly going from, again, just to kind of put it from a gamer point of view, going from, wait, I need to buy a memory card for this console? Why doesn't it just store it in, you know, the cartridge? And, you know, oh, now there's a 60 gigabyte hard drive. Whoa, that's so much storage <laughs> to... <laughs> To, what am um, I going to do with all that? <laughs> yeah, I know. And then by the end of that generation, we were already up to like 500 gigabytes of standard, basically. Right. And, and, and you know, just SSDs and now they're ubiquitous, even in cheap devices. I mean, heck, even in like the newest $400 PlayStation, they've got a Gen 4 SSD with like 12 memory channels. And it's in, it, cra- crazy. You know, they basically got some kind of next gen server technology they're throwing in there just to just because storage is so important to everything i think it's been so neglected in games actually in the past 10 years so 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 like for me it's been dizzy and watching all this growth in storage like but but for you what has it been like to watch storage evolve over the last 40 years start wherever you want i mean we had sure i mean i'm thinking of like magnetic tapes and then also just the gigantic hard drives and my dad used to work at ibm as well I remember he showed me some of the early hard drives and processors they had. He's like, well, the socketed processor is the size of your monitor, Tom. <laughs> and he just put that right in a motherboard the size of a wall. But Yeah, one of my professors in at, and when I did my master's degree um, worked at IBM on that first five megabyte hard drive. Mm-hmm. And one of the fascinating things he told us uh, about that was there was a race inside IBM. And this was done on, down at IBM. Um, IBM Almaden, if I recall correctly, right here in San Jose area. And there was a race between magnetic storage and optical storage. Mm -hmm. Literally, they were neck and neck. And magnetic storage won by a hair on getting across the finish line first to showing Mm -hmm. viability. And then that got all the support. And so optical kind of uh, languished for quite a while until it found its place outside of IBM. Mm-hmm. You're really growing. Um, so magnetic storage has come a really long way. Uh, yes, as a memory guy, I've called it spinning rust for the longest time. And even a decade ago, I was at a conference where, you know, to see a hard disk drive guy stand up and say, you know, our SSD is going to overtake us in the hard drive business. Yes. But I'm going to stick around to and insert your number, you know, pull the last two trillion dollars out of this business, you know, or whatever his number yeah. is. So, yeah, hard drives are going to be around for a long time. Um, but I think the real transition point and uh, well, I'll tell one more side story. When in Sandisk in the early days, Eli Harari used to say, look, when we can make memory, which is behind this controller, but it looks like a hard drive. Yeah. When it, when it costs 50% more, so it's 150% the price, more people will use it. Well, he was totally wrong. Totally mm-hmm. wrong. Because we never got to that price at SanDisk in the early days. And people started using it, but they used it for something different. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that was the key that, that um, the whole memory, uh, you know, using memory technology as stores, the whole SSD thing came about first from, like you said, these memory cards and other places where you needed something small, low power and portable. Mm-hmm. And eventually the whole manufacturing infrastructure worked up to a point yep. converting to NAND technology. And then I clearly remember sitting in um, the IEDM conference, which is about bit cells and devices, when Samsung showed in their paper that the what the, they were referring to as the aerial density of NAND flash with 3D NAND crossed over the aerial density of what hard disk drives could do. Mm-hmm. And, and that was a point I had probably been waiting for for about 15 years. Because once you see that, then you know the, even the economics are going to tip. And, yeah. and that's where we saw this tipping point. And we've seen SSDs zoom ahead where now you can start to consider, you know, where hard drives kind of been this eight terabyte, 12 terabyte, you know, kind of scraping along. And how do we get to the next, you know, increment of a couple more terabytes? With 3D NAND, you're just doubling and doubling and doubling. Yeah. And kind of on that that roadmap. So, and that came about from, you know, decades of work in developing non-volatile memory technology and getting it more dense, more dense, um, applying some new concepts. The the idea of doing 3D, and there's been this competing idea in memory of do you do 3D or do you do cross point? Um, and we'll come to cross point a little bit later on. But 3D NAND was a major breakthrough. And for those of us that have backgrounds in fab for non volatile mm-hmm. memory, when we first looked at it, we said, no way can you build it. What are you mm-hmm. talking about? This is crazy. Um, this builds such a high aspect ratio structure. And then without lithography, you make all these bit cell connections. It's wild. But uh, to go now to you know 100, 100 layer plus 3D NAND, um, we've seen that in the SSD capacity just grow and grow. And, and so it's been, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting that you asked me kind of that longer view, man, I've been in this three plus decades and mm-hmm. in some ways the story is only just beginning. Yeah. And that, that's an amazing thing to, to wrap your head around. You know, it's like, wow, some of these same ideas and some fall out of favor and then they come back later. Um, but the trajectory has just been up, up, up setbacks occur. Mm -hmm. Uh, So before we get into other memory technologies, you know, one of my mantras is the future, what is the future of DRAM and what is the future of NAND? Mm -hmm. Let me be very clear. The future of NAND is NAND. The future of DRAM is DRAM. These two are going to be around for a long, long time, just like hard disk drives are still around with us and and fill a certain need. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, is there something in between because there's no replacement. I call a replacement the R word. We don't say it in the memory business because it doesn't exist. There has never been one-to-one replacement in the memory business. No, just I think usually things take a larger piece of the pies. They fill so, more roles, right? So, so look, the end customer system designers hate that message. They hate that. Wait, I want something that looks just like this, but is more dense and lower power and faster. And don't mm-hmm. make me do any work. Well, you know, one time everything looked more like SRAM. And then somebody came up with this idea of DRAM and said, well, but you got to go in and refresh it all the time. Well, that's a pain in the ass. Why do I want to do that? You know, I have to change my system. I have to put in a memory controller dedicated to doing that refresh. Yes, you do. But it's lower cost. So part, another mantra of mine is lowest cost bit cell always wins. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get that low cost bit cell? And the challenge in the memory business has been, there's lots of things that could be a lower cost bit cell, but how do you get the the yield up, get the volume up, get the economics up to where it's lower cost? And so there, you know, every year there's an announcement of something that's going to be the great new memory technology. Um, And and I have to point out, it's a multi-billion dollar problem for each memory manufacturer to take a new memory technology into production. Mm -hmm. So that's where I do admire Micron and Intel for investing in 3D Crosspoint um, and taking the long view. 
Intel has subsidized Optane for many yeah. years to get it to this point where they can now price it below DRAM and pretty significantly below DRAM to get customers to use it. Um, but to your listeners, don't be fooled by you know these breakthroughs in memory technology. <laughs> you know, because think of the the infrastructure, the fab, the manufacturing, the know how that has to take place to bring that technology to a point where it is the lowest cost bit cell. And then the the second part to that is the system will change to accommodate the the hardware the 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 CPU the SOC whatever it is that's connected to memory will change to uh, get that lowest cost bit cell in. Uh, so system designers, sorry, but you're going to have to do that. You know that's that's the way this works in the memory business. So so that's my speechifying my stump speech about new memory yeah. technologies. Well, so Luis Correa writes in and says, hello, Tom and Dave. My question is for Dave. I see you've been on the product development field for quite some time now. I want to hear your insight on how the paradigms for designing storage devices have changed throughout the years. What design choices have been prioritized through the years uh, and then changed and why? Yeah, yeah. Good, good question. Thank you very much for that question. I think there's one other question also kind of related, which talked about what's the hardest part or most difficult part of designing a, a, a storage controller for these memory devices. Mm-hmm. So having done it myself at, at Micron for, with my team for, for uh, several years, the hardest part um, is the power loss management. That's actually really difficult because oh, as a storage yeah. device, when you give me a, a data and you say, I want you to write that data, I want to handshake that command right away and free up the bus and say, yeah, I got that. I'll, I'll store that. And you don't have to worry. That's stored. But non-volatile memory takes quite a while to store that data. And so what happens if we get power loss in the middle? So this was very difficult on, on flash memory cards because the user could yank the card out in the middle of an operation. The second most difficult problem um, goes all the way back to when I was at, at SanDisk and continues to be a problem, which is in, it's a major breakthrough for these, uh, for these controllers in SSDs and then also other memory controllers is I'm, uh, when I'm virtualizing from logical to physical address, mm-hmm. I have to keep tables and I have to keep tables of where everything's at physically. and. It's a great thing to virtualize. And by the way, I am looking forward to the day when DRAM gets virtualized uh, back to the mm-hmm. processor. We're not there yet, but NAND definitely is. NAND on its own is a crappy memory technology. So we have to manage it. And that means we have bit errors, mm-hmm. we have word line errors, we have bit line errors, we have things that failed in the factory, we have things that fail in the field. So I've got to keep all these tables. That's a lot of information. Yet at the same time, when a read command comes in from the host, I've got to get through that table very quickly to find that data to respond. So I can get my read IOPS way up as just an example. And then on write, I can't take too long manipulating those tables and actually writing the data. And then when do I handshake? So those are the two biggest problems that I've seen that are difficult to design for. I mentioned all the way at the beginning of our talk when I was at at SanDisk and then at Micron, we designed our own controllers to go with our own memory technology, Mm -hmm. and they were in sync. You know, and it was really how we could do a new controller faster than we could do a new memory technology. Mm -hmm. So the 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 scale, you know, the pace of evolving memory was what made it uh, made it the trick. What we've seen is a decoupling of the controller from from NAND flash, right? Uh, yeah. A NAND flash maker like a Micron or a Samsung or an SK Hynix, they sell NAND components uh, or, or did in the past, NAND components to a wide variety of things. Or you can put it with controllers from a, a Fiazon, a Silicon Motion, yeah. uh, these guys. And, and that's allowed innovation to be decoupled. And that's led to much faster cycles in, in um, product evolution. One of your questions was, what took PCIe Gen 4 so long, though? <laughs> and yeah. uh, that was an interesting question to me. 
And I think that one, um, I, at least my opinion on that, and that has to do with product cycle as well, is the interface. And in, in this case, the interface depended on the CPU vendor. Intel, as we talked about, was very late in going from PCIe Gen 3 to PCIe Gen 4. AMD, embarrassingly for Intel, AMD uh, did much better on rolling out PCIe Gen 4. If you're a controller maker, you know, and, and, and you're making a, let's call it a $100 million bet on a new controller, you're not going to release that controller until you're sure the big guy in the CPU business mm. has something you can hook up to. So I don't see this being so much a delay on the controller guy. I see it as they're watching the roadmap. And, you know, the question specifically was about Fizon. You know, maybe Fizon watches Intel and they say, damn, Intel hasn't come out with their PCIe Gen 4 for a while. So I'm not going to invest that $100 million until I have to. So I think right. that that's and, it, and you're talking about, you know, Steak and Chicken Man has a question ahead where he asked, you know, it was, why is the development cycle so long? You know, Fizen hasn't launched their fastest Gen 4 controllers yet. And this is something I've heard a lot of people talk about just in relation to the next generation game consoles. Because in fact, the PS5's built-in SSD is faster than almost anything you can buy. I would argue still even faster than the fastest Samsung one overall. Um, the on the desktop market. And it's to the point where Sony's even disabled the extra upgrade bay in the console just because they say, well, there's nothing on the market yet. So we don't want people putting slow stuff in there. And, and, it, and it's, yeah, it's because Intel isn't making Gen... They will with Rocket Lake. They'll support Gen 4, you know, then. But, uh, you know, like it, AMD wasn't enough for everyone to put hundreds of millions of dollars into it, is what you're saying. Yeah, it's for, for, for chicken and steak, man, it's the chicken and egg problem, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. who goes first. And if I'm a, a controller maker with relatively thin margin, um, you know, the, the margin on those devices is not great these days. Uh, so they have to kind of hold back and invest when it makes, makes sense for them, where they see enough business in that. So I think that that's, that's a key element is there's also this economic thing. Can't just push, you know, it's great if we can push technology ahead and ignore economics, but uh, it's not the way it works. Yeah. And so on, you know, the, another memory question that I think is interesting here is Carbon Cry writes in again and asks, could you do a short post-mortem on HMC? How ah. did it end up losing to HBM? I know it was after Dave's time at Micron, but hopefully you have something interesting you can say. I do remember HMC, I believe NVIDIA was helping with that development too. This was years ago. I remember AMD yes. talking about HBM. Then NVIDIA was, started talking about HMC and it never went anywhere. I was very excited when Micron announced HMC because to, to go back to something we said earlier in this discussion, um, and I kind of slipped it in there, but uh, NAND has been very successful as an imperfect memory technology. Mm -hmm. And so, so NAND is, is cheap and slow and crappy. DRAM is fast and cheap and has to be perfect or near perfect. And so one of the questions, I think one of your other listeners uh, was talking about DRAM and and moving forward because DRAM has been stalled in scaling. And to me, the biggest reason it's been stalled is because we expect it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. If DRAM could be imperfect, if DRAM could have this kind of controller in front of it that manages defects, DRAM scaling can begin again. Now there's a couple things you need that controller. Um, that controller virtualizes. So again, you have a logical to physical. You do some kind of error management, some kind of ECC. Uh, so, so there's a number of things that, that go into this, but you could restart DRAM if you hide it behind some, some logic. HMC, when it was first announced, I thought, this is it. This is the first product we're going to see which virtualizes that. I think their problem, and, and look, they had a high degree of parallelism there between die, within the die, but it all, it all got piped through a logic chip. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the kind of, you know, block management that we see in NAND controllers, but they did have some level of ECC inside there. Um, so I really like the concept and I, I still think there's ideas that are there. But I Is think there something I, you liked about it more than HBM then? 
Yes, I like the oper- again. Everything's kind of flowing through this logic die, so you have the opportunity and 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 of doing that virtualization in the future mm-hmm. and going logical to physical. I think HBM won because it was the brute force approach. Yeah, and it still kept uh, DRAM. So another thing, uh, a second thing about DRAM versus NAN, DRAM um, it requires a synchronous interface over DDR. You must respond to a read or write within this time. Well, NAN doesn't have that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an asynchronous interface over over PCIe and VME, right? We we ask it to read, we ask it to write, and then it can take as long as it needs to. And sometimes it blows up and takes too long. But you know, it, we allow asynchronous behavior. So those are the two things that could happen with DRAM in the future. Still, nobody saying it can't happen yet. Um, is to virtualize and go logical to physical and then also allow asynchronous behavior over the interface. And when we come to discussing CXL, CXL allows these things for DRAM. So it's mm-hmm. it's two important points of where we're going in the future with memory technology. So kind of back to HMC, I, w- I was really excited by it, but the brute force approach won out, which is massive parallelism, keeping not in, in not injecting that additional latency of running through lo- a logic chip mm-hmm. uh, but and keeping it as per- perfect or near perfect memory um i don't think we can do that trick in the memory business much longer i think mm-hmm. we're kind of running out of uh, running out of tricks um and you look at the tremendous cost of you know it's great for a gpu but you look at the tremendous cost of that hbm that's uh, that's in there. I, I talked to a guy a couple of weeks ago that his analysis says, you know, especially as we look at the GPU being uh, from the A100s being carved up into smaller units now, which mm-hmm. NVIDIA is talking about, the actual memory bandwidth usage from these smaller units is about 7%. <laughs> so we're burdening it with tremendous cost, but we're not getting the performance out we need. So, um, so I think HBM is that brute force parallelism, perfect memory approach. That's the easiest for the system guy to go implement. Mm. But with a little more system thinking and changes, uh, I think we're going to see some, some new approaches. Um, what exactly those look like? I don't know yet. Stay tuned. So Bollocks writes in and asks, what do you think of the purported irrelevancy of high performance memory, which focuses less on capacity and more on latency and throughput? I personally find it rather odd how increasing capacity and decreasing power usage, which are server-focused requirements, are the only markets seemingly being served by new technology. And and he does a lot of memory overclocking for high refresh rate gaming and stuff. So that's where it's a great from. It's a great question. I I, I'm not going to have a very thorough answer other than my experience in the memory business is I can rarely get anyone to pay me more for better performance or lower power. They'll pay me for more bits, Mm -hmm. but they won't pay me for performance or power or limited, just limited areas. Everybody seems to want, you know, kind of the base level price. Mm -hmm. And, And so that, yes, there's things in memory technology that can be done. Um, but is there enough, uh, enough customer base to pay for those developments? And if we're, so break down the memory business um, in a couple of ways. If we're talking about a controller or interface change, that's relatively cheap. You know, yes, we talked about a controller being a $50 million tape out, but in the memory business, that's cheap. If we're talking about a design change for a memory chip, you know, that's, that's a couple hundred million dollar bet. So if I'm going to do a custom memory chip, it's pretty expensive. So can I recover my cost? If it requires a process change, those get really expensive really fast. And then we get to the top level, which is if I require a completely new fab with a new mix of equipment, you know, that's a $10 billion investment up front. So, you know, depending on where we go, you know, we have to look at how do we reuse the, um, what we've paid for already in the memory business in order to kind of, kind of leverage that. And, and that leads to the, the memory business being largely evolutionary. Mm-hmm. Um, rather than revolutionary. Um, and let's be frank. I mean, when times are good, it looks like 
DRAM prices and NAND prices are, are going to head back up here in 2021. Yeah, probably. Micron wants to crank out as many wafers of what they already make right now uh, using those fab turns to make as much money in the good times. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's kind of always been the dilemma is when good times, I can't get fab starts for the new experiments. Mm-hmm. And in bad times, we don't have any money to yeah. do new things. And yeah, you can kind of get caught in that cycle. Um, I think the memory guys have, you know, just like the hard disk drive guys, the irrationality has kind of gone out of the business. Mm-hmm. And we see much better behavior than we used to see decades ago. You know, keep in mind, I talk about Micron and before I joined them, but I remember Micron was number nine in the DRAM business. Mm-hmm. Nine? Yeah. There were 30 guys in the DRAM business and we would see all kind of crazy behavior. So once we get down to duopolies or, uh, you know, two to four players, you know, that's when things we, we see more rational behavior in the market, but it does affect the kind of revolutionary yeah. things we could go do. Well, and I mean, even just speaking on like what people are actually willing to pay for, even just looking at gamers, you know, they'll go to Newegg or Amazon and in the filter, they'll put two times eight gigabytes and then that's it, lowest price. And then that's That's typically what they buy as long as it doesn't have two two out of five stars or something in the review. And I've always like told people, you know, there's always going to be a bottleneck in gaming performance, whether it's the graphics card processor, or RAM, even eventually if it's an old system, just the interface making them communicate with each other. But, you know, oftentimes it's just five, ten more dollars, you know, maybe $70 instead of 60 to get, say, 3,600 megahertz memory instead of 2,400. And I'm like, that's a 50% increase in bandwidth. And it's like, and I've always been really annoyed at gaming websites that are like, well, in this game, it didn't do much. Because if you look hard enough, you can find some games where there's like a 30%, a linear boost almost in yes. frame rates in some edge cases. And you paid $10 to get maybe in a few games a 30% boost. I think that's worth the money, but rarely do people look for that. It's usually just about capacity and that's all they worry about. Correct. And that, and that's in you know, that's in the the consumer market where people are even sensitive to price. And just think about, you know, companies that are buying millions or tens of millions of something, you know, Mm -hmm. they send in their purchasing agent and it's price. They don't debate performance. You know, the engineers might say, this is, this is the performance we need. Mm -hmm. Go buy it for me at the cheapest price. And so that, that kind of plays all the way through. Uh, so even if we see it at a consumer level where somebody's buying one of something, again, think about it when you're signing a contract to buy millions of something, you know, performance is a line item on the purchase order and not debated. <laughs> it just is what it is. Well, it's the holiday season, and you know what that means. Lots of travel for this holiday season, and hopefully for a more open 2021. I bought a studio laptop for mobile editing. And of course, well, it didn't come with an open license of Microsoft Office. And those can be very expensive, especially for the professional version. But luckily, I was able to get Microsoft Office Professional for a reasonable price from cdkoffers.com. Go to cdkoffers.com and use the promotional code Broken Silicon to get 25% off an already cheap list price of Windows 10 Professional. Then all you do is click on your email account, go to user center and then my purchase orders to get the code just use this code with a normal download of windows 10 professional from microsoft's website all right links in the description uh so and that's a pretty good segue i know one of the things i was gonna say it was optane and talk about optane ssds uh so you made some very good points there a minute ago um i thought yeah Perfect segue in. The next discussion is Optane. I was actually connected to you because I kept asking to talk to somebody with some <laughs> something to say about Optane outside of, I mean, just, just kind of to set the table for this next part of the conversation. I, I remember, and remember, this is coming from someone who, you know, bought SSDs before they were cheap. I was like, no, 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 it's so worth it. I would rather have this than a high-end graphics card for sure. And then I saw Optane as the next thing after SSDs. And I was like, yes, make it even faster. 
And then I was like a thousand X performance in every way. And then I waited a few years. I'm like, where is it? Now you guys are advertising 100 X. What's that about? I thought you said a thousand. Then they advertise 10 X. And then the what reviews come out. Thousand. Where's my thousand X? Where's my latte? You know. And then the <laughs> reviews happened? came out, right? And it's like slower in most use cases than the latest <laughs> Samsung NAND SSD. And I go, well, what the heck? What happened? What happened there? there? What yeah. happened? Yeah. So Optin is a, is a very interesting story with uh, some successes and some failures. Um, but uh, I'll go back to a couple weeks after Micron and Intel launched Optane. and and I was tracking this technology well ahead of that uh, for some of my clients. But a couple of weeks after they launched, it was Flash Memory Summit. And we did a crash uh, seminar about what has now called Optane. At that time, it was called 3D Crosspoint. And I remember, uh, first of all, we, we filled that conference room to overflowing. We probably had about mm-hmm. 750 people show up. And I did two sections to it. And the first was, what the technology is, um, and, and to cut to the quick, you know, Intel and Micron have been evasive about it. But 3D Crosspoint is a variation of what's called phase change technology. Um, phase change has been used very successfully in optical drives, and it uses heat to switch a material between amorphous and crystalline state. Very recent invited paper from Intel. Uh, uh, a guy I respect greatly named Al Fazio, who's kind of seen this through for decades at Intel. He did talk about how Intel and Micron um, improved upon that kind of what I call classical phase change memory Mm -hmm. to come up with more volumetric switching, et cetera. So in other words, Intel and AMD did some, uh, some good material science into taking this technology, which was really niche had some problems in doing it in memory and uh, you know now coming up with something their their latest is a 256 gigabit chip mm-hmm. uh, which is really I, I can't explain how difficult it is if you have to have such tight control of your bit cell in memory to get that many bits working on a single chip and then you put dozens of these chips inside an SSD or on a dim uh, to do a certain job. So again, hats off to Intel. Micron doing the manufacturing there, by the way, not Intel. Mm. <laughs> and Micron is still very, very good at manufacturing. Um, so that was the first part of my talk. I, I believe that was back in 2015. Um, the second part of the talk is, well, how do you use it? You know, Why do you care about the memory technology? There was obsession with that. But much more important is how do you use it? And even Intel in their patent filings uh, leading up to that, we're showing that they were using it for load and store memory as kind of this two-tier memory uh, hierarchy where you use DRAM as your near memory mm-hmm. and then you use 3D crosspoint as your far memory. So make no mistake about it, Optane for Intel was always about the memory and using it as load and store memory. Now, why did they do SSDs? Because SSDs was the best place for them to ramp up the manufacturing and put mm. some memory chips out there. Um, get and volume get, going. Get the know. volume going. And look, it's pretty good. Um, the problem was, um, I think their marketing department didn't get the memo. Mm. And listen. Uh, that's to, very common at Intel. <laughs> listen to the engineers saying, here's what's great about the memory cell. Mm-hmm. And then myself is kind of straddling memory and system. Um, I was shocked when they said it's a thousand times faster because I'm like, there's no way you can do that on a PCIe in- or interface. You know, you're just not going to achieve that. And uh, you and I talked about that leading up to our discussion today. That one of the most important things about developing a product is balancing the front end of the interface on a controller versus the back end. Mm -hmm. And you have to to balance those two. And you also have to consider the software stack and what the delays are. So Intel, to their credit, did do some work on reducing that software stack down Mm -hmm. to what could be the minimum through... And so the NVMe stack today... Um, is commonly has an overhead of six microsecond adder. The problem that Optane SSDs suffer from is 
the technology itself is down in the hundreds of nanoseconds performance. So you can't see how fast the memory technology actually is when you put it on an NVMe interface because of, it's entirely bottlenecked, right? It's bottlenecked completely. And it's bottlenecked largely from the software stack. Mm-hmm. So, you know, interesting, but you look at it in one of your prior comments was, damn, it's expensive compared to NAND. Very, especially when it first came out. That's I right. was like, my God, this is like double the price for arguably worse performance in some applications. And at double the price, Intel was losing about $500 million a year. So it was much more it's still than still below cost. Yeah. It, it's, they subsidized heavily and mm. uh, to get the thing off the ground. And it cost them a lot of money. Um, but they did it. You know, they stuck with it. But they stuck with it to get to the point where Optane DIMMs, which finally debuted in 2020, mm-hmm. could finally be there. And now we start to see where you have you know, hundreds of gigabytes to terabytes of this now load and store memory. Now, they've put it on the DDR4 bus. Mm-hmm. They did that by allowing asynchronous behavior on the DDR4 bus. So remember, we talked earlier about abstracting mm-hmm. and, and putting it on there. Now, so they do, um, they do logical to physical on their memory controller on the, uh, between the CPU and the DIMM. And they also allow asynchronous behavior. So it kind of hits both those points of what you need to do to use non-volatile memory technology and put it on a, a memory bus. The other thing, let's, let's make a really important point here about system mm-hmm. architecture. We've now moved persistence, which has always been on the I.O. bus and not in the cache coherent network. And again, cache coherence going all the way back through the CPU L1, L2, last mm-hmm. level cache. Now we've moved persistence inside the cache coherent network by putting it on the DDR bus. Yeah. So initially, I think analysts looked at this and said, oh, these are great cheap bits that we're putting on so we get higher capacity dims i mean that's how i was and let's be fair to consumers like myself that's what i was told it was for <laughs> right and it, it was like and it can be both storage or ram but it's slower than one and faster than the other that's right and it's slow ram so we'll come back and talk about the problems of putting it on the ddr bus but it's a logical choice for intel to do that um, but the best use of Optane DIMMs is when you use it for its capacity and you use it for its persistence. Mm-hmm. That's where we're starting to see the market take off. Now, and this is for servers. Let's, let's be clear. It's not, it's not in other applications. This is for servers. In-memory me- in database is a great place for this mm-hmm. because in-memory database we waste a lot of time doing IO operations. You know, when we want, if we have limited memory and we have a database which is larger than our memory size, which is very common. When you say memory, you mean like DDR4, right? Sure. Size. So sure. you're saying like you can store far more than what you can right you now. Can, right. You can store more. And in addition, it's persistent. Right. Which means I no longer have to activate and send stuff to my I.O. hub out to the SSD to store. So I don't, in my checkpointing, everything is done internal with the memory system. And so you'll hear me refer to that always as load and store. You know, because that's mm-hmm. a load and store access to memory instead of doing blocks, files, objects out to I.O. And remember, if I go to I.O., even if it's NVMe, which is the fastest, I've got a six microsecond overhead. Well, that sucks. You know, mm-hmm. even if I have a small amount of data, I don't, I don't want to incur that overhead. So if I can keep everything in memory and I persist that data in my memory, that's pretty cool. So companies are starting to latch on to this. One of the, one of the ones that Intel points to and, uh, is Oracle. Now, very expensive system. It's the Exadata system. Mm-hmm. But Oracle is the king of online transaction processing. In other words, when you go to a travel site or you do other things, you're purchasing online, that's OLTP. Um, And the whole issue for them was that latency or that extra hit in going all the way out to IO and checkpointing and coming back on the database as you make a purchase. 
by keeping it all in memory, by keeping it persistent in Optane memory, they don't have to flush it anymore to the SSD. You know, that, that radically improves their performance. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, let's, these types of systems are, you know, extremely expensive systems on Exadata, but their customers will pay for that. You know, American Express on doing financial transactions, et cetera. Um, Travelocity on doing their travel sites, whether they do it themselves or they do it in the cloud. So that's a very interesting use of, of Optane DIMMs. And that's where we're seeing it start to take place. Now, one of the problems has been the application needs to be aware that there's persistent memory out there. Mm -hmm. And if you ask anybody to rewrite their application, that's kind of a a big barrier for them. It's usually Uh, a big ask. It's a big ask. And I... Uh, the the speaker from VMware last year that was talking about using Optane DIMMs, they were able to get better performance, but they had to change their compiler. Okay, mm-hmm. that that's now you're really starting to get into the guts and tinkering around. So that's been difficult for this birthing of this new thing that's between an SSD and DRAM, um, but it's persistent, but it's also uh, in the cache coherent network. And yes, it's on the, the DDR bus. Um, but we have seen the rise of uh, some very smart people, uh, smart engineers from VMware, left and formed a company called Memverge that is virtualizing that. Uh, so you no longer have to rewrite your application. You don't get optimum performance mm-hmm. like an Oracle would. You know, Oracle will invest to get that every, every bit of speed because uh, they're selling an expensive unit. But for everybody else, you know, maybe I'll put a layer of software, a middle layer of software in there that virtualizes that where my application no longer needs to know that there's both DRAM and persistent memory out there and I can switch back and forth. So, so this ecosystem is starting to grow to pull Optane SSDs back in here. You know, in 2020, Optane SSDs, I think, sold about $750 million. Mm-hmm. Still pretty good, you know. Not non trivial. Um, Optane DIMMs were a few hundred million. Very quickly, that number will, will grow on Optane DIMMs, whereas Optane SSDs will stay pretty much, you know, about that mil, um, billion dollar mark. And I think that eventually we expect in a couple of years that Optane memory, Optane DIMMs, will be uh, three to four times the size of the Optane SSD business. So, so again, I think Intel is looking at the longer picture using it as memory, and then um, growing that market. Um, so, well, so, yeah, I mean, like, go ahead. then from my in, perspective, please. right, like, I think, and my God, the amount of times I've heard from sources, people talking about how someone's working at, engineers are working on something at Intel, the marketing people get a hold of it, and then it just turns into being described as an entirely different device than it actually is like the way it's been told to gamers is well obtains lower latency and it's a great ssd and you're kind of saying the entire interface makes it almost a waste to use Optane for that except yes. for i've seen niche applications where it makes a big difference there, there are some niche applications i agree which can take advantage of it where the economics also makes sense but go ahead but and then you know, using it, it's really not supposed, you know, just because it's in between doesn't mean it should be both. It should be its own thing with its own interface Correct. that maximizes its usage, right? And, and we're getting there, you know, just like we use the example in the past of, you know, uh, starting out with NAND flash, making it look like a hard disk drive, which you could say was a really stupid idea, but it's mm-hmm. a place we can hook it up. So making Optane, or we in the industry, we generally call it persistent memory. Mm-hmm. Um, making persistent memory look like DRAM is a pretty stupid idea, but it's a place to start. And and I think this is one of the places where Intel is eventually going to outgrow. And um, my my view has been that it three D crosspoint does belong as a memory um, persistent memory inside the cache coherent network, but putting it in a DDR slot. You're basically asking customers to unplug DRAMs, which they already own, 
mm. and plug in something that's slower. Yeah. Yes, it's lower cost per bit, but and that's and a lot bird- slower. And then burdening the memory controller. Well, it's getting it's getting pretty good. It's 100 nanosecond to 340 nanosecond read, which is getting pretty good uh, at system level. Um, but that that's not the right place because especially as we go to DDR5, we're now looking at maybe one dim per channel, mm-hmm. a half a dim per channel. There, there's talk about putting you know two channels per dim. Mm-hmm. So you know the number we we start to run into a new limit which is the number of memory controllers we have on our CPU, DDR memory controllers we have on our CPU. And we want to fill all those slots with DRAM. You know, that's what's going to get in a server. That's what's going to mm-hmm. give us our best performance and in other places as well. So with the number of DIMMs per channel shrinking, you know, we have to look somewhere else to, to deploy this new technology. And that's what's exciting to me about this reuse of the PCIe link for something called CXL. And uh, that's also one of the issues Intel has had on Optane memory is, remember we said it's, it's plugged in on a DDR4 bus, Sapphire Rapids, it's DDR5. But in order to have both Optane and DRAM on the same bus, we have to have a superset of commands for Optane. Mm-hmm. Intel decided to make that proprietary. They didn't go through JEDEC mm-hmm. to, to open that up. So that's called DDRT is what that's called, layered on top of, it's a transactional protocol layered on top of the DDR bus. Um, Intel, as a proprietary thing, um, has kind of built that fence around their CPU and around Optane. And I think Intel finally realized a number of us were, were advocating for them to open up and bring that to JEDEC, so open up that ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, Intel decided to go, which I think is the right, ultimately the right decision, instead of opening up DDRT for them, is to open up uh, this new interface called CXL. And CXL started off life as a way to exa- attach accelerators mm-hmm. uh, to processors. But now a lot of work over the last uh, couple of years has gone into how do we attach memory to processors using the same interface. And now that opens, think of it as a side channel, where now we have memory, our DRAM, go back to just having DRAM on that DDR bus. And then now we have this standardized industry standard interface using PCIe electricals uh, with much uh, better performance than PCIe because we limit the data unit size to 64 bytes, which mm-hmm. hardware can handle. So we no longer have this barrier of drivers and you know six microsecond um, adder like we suffer on NVMe. Right, and, and and just to like kind of state it for everyone, you you explained CXL to me. This is an interface that uses you know PCIe electricals, just like NVMe and NVMe drives connected to those use. Except this one removes that latency bottleneck, right? Yes, it has a very hardware-centric protocol. And instead of having software on either side or firmware on either side that's managing it, it's all hardware managed. Mm -hmm. And so the latency adder for CXL, you know, I'm hearing numbers from the CPU vendors and they're they're starting to get their first silicon on this, um, is about 30 nanoseconds. Now that's 30 nanoseconds over and above what you'd get on a DDR link. Mm-hmm. A DDR bus. So CXL is slower latency wise uh, than DDR, which is fine for something like Optane because mm-hmm. Optane itself is slower than DRAM. Uh, so opening up that opportunity gives us, a, it's a slower, but it's a place where we can add more things and it's virtualized. Mm-hmm. So again, we can do a logical to physical address. We got that trick. Inside, the, there's going to be a controller. And so the main DRAM buffer chip companies are all off designing controllers mm-hmm. for this new CXL interface. And we will see DRAM on CXL, and we will see persistent memory on CXL in addition to accelerators. So it's a very exciting ecosystem. There's something called the CXL Consortium, which now has well over 200 members. 
of the association um, rapidly innovating in opening up this side channel. And then the main benefit from just a memory perspective is because we have limited bandwidth per core, Mm -hmm. because we have so many cores in the CPU and that is throttled through the number of our memory controllers. Right. Is we open up, you know, up to an order of magnitude more bandwidth through parallelism on the CXL link. And you were explaining to me, right, that right now they're looking at getting to like 10 DDR memory channels and server. And it's just at a certain point, you're just throthrowing more and more memory channels. Yeah, 16. And and it's like those take up space. Those use a ton of energy eventually. And instead, we could just have like a small amount, uh, relatively speaking, of DDR memory channels that That's then right. can communicate with a persistent memory that then can communicate with an NVMe storage device. Yeah, and one of your listeners asked a, a good question about DDR6. What what happens with DDR6? Um, and and that's that's a and they brought up PAM4, which I I actually do believe in. Uh, but how long can we go on with with the DDR channels? Because we're going to want more memory controllers. We're going to want mm-hmm. to go to 32 to 64 memory controllers per CPU to keep the bandwidth per core at a somewhat respectable number of a couple of gigabytes per second. Um, we're going to want to do that. Well, if each DDR bus is still parallel, and yes, there's some reduction in that between DDR4 and DDR5, you know, 72-bit wide bus to 40-bit wide bus. I mean, that helps, but that's not good enough. You know, we do have to go to a serial interface to memory. Mm -hmm. Whether IBM's Omni or Omni, I should say. Yeah. Oh, this is taking Chicken Man's question, by the way. Yeah, it's OMI. I think OMI is a, a really good concept. I don't see the CPU makers and memory makers adopting it as is. I see them, you know, much much as in the past, you know, doing sync DRAM instead of RAM bus DRAM, you know, I mean, that's Mm -hmm. happened in the past, but um, I think the idea to go to serial is the right one. And then what one of your other readers was asking about, our listeners was asking about was PAM4, you know, PAM4 and doing encoding also makes sense. And we do start to see that in GDDR, uh, is GDDR6 right now? 6X maybe. I I don't remember. So I think that... Uh, that Micron has a yeah, Micron has a chip with PAM4 that they announced, mm-hmm. I think, two months ago. Um, so, you know, we see the memory makers starting to play around with it. Now, I think the concern from your listener was, was you know, PAM4, how much, how much current would that, how much power would that take, et cetera. Because it's been an run- issue with Ampere graphics cards that use GDR6X. I, I think it may be more complex than just the signaling, but I think that's part of it. The good thing is, you know, communication protocols are way ahead of us Mm -hmm. in doing, you know, slim down serial communications with very high, you know, high frequency, et cetera, with encoding. So we've got a lot of, uh, we're we're kind of decades behind in that. And you think of the DDR bus still being largely a parallel bus. um, Boy, that's, that's really going back generations now in, in computer architecture. So, so I think we will go serial Mm -hmm. and I think we're going to have to uh, do some level of encoding. And the question is, do we also do some of these other things like virtualize and allow asynchronous behavior uh, at the same time? That's what I'd love to see. I mean, I'd love to see DDR6 be that, um, but I think we're going to have to take it in steps. And I think the serial interface, it comes first. So, uh, so I think those are some of the, some of the challenges, but uh, coming back around to persistent memory and Optane, I think op- so with Sapphire Rapids, uh, Intel will roll out the first generation CXL. That'll be CXL 1.1, mm-hmm. which is which is good for accelerators. It it turns out it's not very good for memory. You have to kind of hack it in there to get memory to work on it. So I don't see the server makers adopting CXL on Sapphire Rapids right away. But the next generation, I think, which is for Intel, is called Granite Rapids. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm expecting CXL 2.0. And then CXL 2.0 is particularly exciting to those of us in the memory business because they introduce CXL 2.0 going through a switch on the rack and having an API for that, um, which allows tremendous fan out. So one of the concepts that myself and others have had for a long time is 
for the data center, how do we break memory, DRAM, persistent memory? How do we break it out of you know server jail? Mm. We're inside the box, and you know if I'm operating, if I'm a cloud guy, they're operating my data center, and I'm using my memory twenty percent of the time. Well, that's eighty percent of my memory that's sitting out there unused. Why couldn't I use it in another spot? You know, mm-hmm. why can't I get better utilization? We've already done that with storage, right? I mean, storage is broken out of jail a long time ago. Yeah, HPC uh, disaggregates and and allows heterogeneous memory, and they've done that for for a long time. So I think we're looking at a major shift in how data centers view memory is rather than having it be bound tightly to a CPU inside a server box, is how can we disaggregate that and share it and put it in a memory appliance? Mm -hmm. And so now our memory appliance would have petabytes of memory, might be DRAM, might be persistent memory. I don't think it'll be NAND because NAND is too slow. Um, But consolidate these different types in an appliance that your utilization of memory now goes way up where it's 80, 90 plus percent utilization and can be shared between CPUs that are running different jobs. Um, That's much more efficient. And I think the economics of that are tremendously appealing to the cloud guys. So that's where I see kind of the the future of memory being driven by the data center is Mm -hmm. to this memory science and this disaggregation. And um, you and I talked about this uh, leading up to today's podcast, but the when we get the economics right for the data center, that'll drive the volume up. Mm. Then we can get the economics to a place where more of the consumer can recognize those gains. Um, then we might see persistent memory be used in mobile phones instead of NAND or be used as a tier. In mobile phones. Well, I was also uh, thinking, you know, you, if it really got cheap, you could almost make a, a super cheap system where you just have persistent memory and you don't need a lot of storage for like a cheap phone. That's it. You don't need RAM. You just have persistent memory. But I just don't think correct. we're even remotely there. That's correct. And I'll take you back that, yeah, we know mobile phones today as having DRAM and NAND. Right. At one time, when I, when I uh, was working at Micron, Mobile phones had five different types of memory. (laughs) I didn't know that. Yep. PS RAM, more flash, you know, some NAND, some DRAM. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. And, and so, uh, you know, a lot of this architecture of how do we get down to just two types of memory was driven. I remember working directly with Nokia on this, you know, how do we reduce the types of memory and get it down to where, and, and being able to boot from, from NAND was a really big deal so that we could get rid of the NOR flash in the phone. Um, But we could see it emerge again where there's enough interest, there's enough benefit. So it doesn't have to just be two types of memory in a phone. Uh, It could be three. And maybe then eventually it'll consolidate and we'll get rid of the NAND. Well, maybe the expensive ones have several types of memory, right? But then the cheap ones, you don't need it. You just have one. Or you get rid of the NAND and you rely on cloud storage because you've got a fast enough link using 5G that I can, you know, basically page in because we've seen that, you know, we used to see phones doubling their capacity every year for, for NAND storage. And we don't see that anymore. It's pretty flat. You know, even my uh, M1 MacBook that I'm using right now to talk to you, you know, compared to my eight year old MacBook Pro. Yeah, maybe I doubled the amount of storage there, but yeah, I still use cloud storage for a lot of things. I no longer have to think about it. So Someone argue that, that's because that's what Apple wants you to do. I have a 300 gigabyte phone. <laughs> of course. Uh, yes, there, there are reasons for that. But uh, um, but to come all the way around on it, let's go back to gamers and, and SSDs. You know, you and I were talking about that. Oh, boy, we couldn't use, we don't want to use persistent memory on the NVMe bus because the software stack is six mm-hmm. microseconds. Well, that's because nobody's worked on it yet. Yeah. And nobody's worked on it because well, where's the technology that's really going to drive this to make us money where mm-hmm. we can, can push it forward? So that, that six microseconds is like anything else. That's a solvable problem. Mm-hmm. 
And it's just how, when is there enough economic uh, forces that drive us in a certain direction using certain bits of technology? So, you know, long and short of it, could Optane persistent memory come around again into uh, very high performance SSDs? Yes, when it, and and makes sense. Yes, when it has a much better cost structure from the volume, mm-hmm. and when somebody's worked out what that interface looks like to to get the best of it, get the best of the performance out of it. Which that's so, Brad Medlin's question is, you know, when will Optane be used more on consumer gaming PCs? Like, when is this going to be yeah. the standard? I mean, you think you need, you basically, we need CXL 2. Point, what was it, 2.0 or 2. something 0. To, yeah. to be standard and the cost to come down so that it just makes right. sense to throw in there. So, so it's over the horizon. You know, this is a five plus, more like 10 year yeah. horizon to me. I, I don't see it anytime soon. I think Optane still has to prove itself in the data center with mm-hmm. the server guys. I think it proves itself on the memory bus moving to CXL. Um, and then it's just got to make economic sense. And then we'll see it migrate into more of the consumer devices. Yeah, it's exciting because I, you know, this has been an Intel play only with Micron as kind of the manufacturing partner. Aren't there competitors but, popping up though that I've heard not the exact same technology, but, com- you know, similar? I fully expect that, but I expect it from Samsung. I expect it from SK Hynix. I saw Seagate was going to get in the memory business because they were so great at hard drives. And we well, just kind of yeah, I, laughed at them. <laughs> that's a good so. comparison point of, okay, well, if that's your opinion about them helping with that, because I do know what you're talking. I remember Seagate saying that and being like, yeah, you don't go to Seagate for a good SSD, guys. Sorry. That's right. Yeah, then the, the memory business is highly specialized in those ten billion dollar fabs, and having many of them uh, kind of make that a, a very difficult thing to go in and compete. So, you know, can, can is innovation going to continue to occur? Well, of course. I mean, again, look at look at NAND going two D to three D. You know, gave it a whole new life. You know, whole new decades of life. DRAM, we're kind of on that cusp where. It's, it's flattened out. The scaling is like 10% a year anymore. You know, it used to be mm. like clockwork, 30 plus percent a year. I'm not talking about price because price fluctuates around, but I'm talking about the, you know, the, the continued scaling. So DRAM has been flat for a while, almost down to single digits. So we're, we're ready for a breakthrough on technology. Um, could Optane be part of that? Yeah, it could be. Or it could be, you know, some new, um, some new material science that goes into the the DRAM cell, and that's another thing I'm I'm keeping track of and interested in. Uh, and 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 again, it's we've hit this theme many many times, but it's not just the technology for the technology's sake, but the economics. Mm. And economics are getting to that point where, you know, main memory and DRAM has to do some new things in order to keep their customers happy, uh, and kind of get out of the way. So. Um, yeah, the memory companies are hard at work at that. And I do expect, I've, I've seen some early prototypes from Samsung using their face change memory. I've read a paper from SK Hynix about their face change memory. They're well aware of what Intel's doing. Um, Kioxia, which is former Toshiba, uh, is not going after phase change technology, but has adopted this new, what's called Ferro uh, High K Dielectrics. They just had a paper. Uh, so they're they're also working on innovating with new technologies. But at the end of the day, as we said quite a while ago, that's a multi-billion dollar bet on a new technology. That's a lot of hurdles to clear. And again, the future of NAND is NAND. The future of DRAM is DRAM. And uh, we'll see if there's something in between. Optane is the best bet right now. Um, a Wyborn writes in and says, what kind of time scale would you expect the current two level storage model to be changed significantly? Stuff like byte addressable non-volatile yeah. storage that can be accessed as an extension. I feel like being Question. able to access and map programs and non-volatile storage in the same way as we would in main or video memory would allow a lot of cutting back on the overheads that have motivated the lack, uh, the developments of IO complexes we see in modern consoles. By the way, great question. And I think that we are, we are at that point for certain applications. And I'll give an example that Intel, by the way, Intel's marketing team on Optane is much better this year. <laughs> they actually are doing a very good job. And they've put out some, some points here with the technical team. Um, Intel went and worked with um, 
uh, some of their customers on an HPC system. And one of the problems, and, and your, your listener is correct, that one of the problems in storage and activating the IO bus is it's block based. Mm -hmm. And a lot of bits of data are not block sized. They're smaller or misaligned blocks. And we wait in the IO subsystem to collect those up before we devote them to storage. And that's a waste of time. And so what, what he's talking about is what if we, instead of waiting, we took and jam those over to obtain memory using load and store, which can handle mm -hmm. much less than block size, you know, 4k block or less. Um, Intel has done that with an HPC customer. And when they did that, uh, they had to create a software layer and, and effectively that software layer, it's called Deos. Um, that software layer steers the misaligned and small, uh, small bits of data over to obtain memory instead. When they did that, they completely blew away the top IO, it's called IO 500 HPC rankings. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a, a startling breakthrough because I think they were three times faster than the previous record holder. Um, because they were eliminating that wasted time. And, and so I think that starting at HPC, um, we'll see that, like a lot of things in HPC, I believe we're going to see that filter down to where this is a more common concept. And it's come to the point where even Intel is talking about two-tiered storage being you're going to use your, for them, NAND storage is the capacity tier, but use Obtain memory on the memory bus as your performance tier, and not not obtain SSDs, but obtain mm -hmm. DIMMs, obtain memory. So, you know that to me is is quite exciting. And then to have that proof point of the IO five hundred work that they did on HPC. Uh, so I, it's it's coming, and we're seeing demonstrations of it of a two -tier tiered memory system, uh, two tiered storage system where we don't activate the IO hub for these small and misaligned blocks, but instead send them to load and store memory. So I, I think I've got quite a few other reader mails here asking about a few things, like just like a blanket question, like what do you think about like the PS5's SSD and stuff like that? But I think you can kind of answer all half of these by just skipping ahead to this question here and just kind of, again, to set the table for this. I mean, the way... Well, actually, the way some of the older consoles were organized was kind of horrific when it comes to latency. Uh, ever since they moved away from cartridges, it was kind of a basket case for loading stuff. But at least when you look at like the Xbox One and PS4, they had a hard drive, they had eight gigabytes of RAM, you know, very understandable how that works. But then moving on to like the PS5, they have what is 825 gigabytes of this you know, six tier, six levels of tiers of organizing data, 12 channel SSD that's at 5.5 gigabytes per second. And then there's 16 gigabytes of RAM. And it actually, at least, certainly not in the last gen games, like you say, the interface completely bottlenecks a lot of the games still. But at least in some of the newer ones they're showing off where they kind of use that highly parallelized SSD right. as, again, some people would, Tar and feather me if I said it's like 800 gigabytes of RAM. It's not. It's not the same as literally having right. 800 gigabytes of RAM. But they're using no, it for and, some things. And it won't perform to. that way. Yeah, but yeah, it, it is perform. you know as fast at some things as like DDR2 bandwidth for some operations. I think you know. So I think a lot of people are talking about like what comes next. Will they just add a bunch more RAM and a bigger SSD? Like how do you see them organizing right. a console? in five to 10 years, like what's right. the next big thing? Because I, because, because you showed me a slide just to be clear that showed like, what was it? 128 gigabytes of Optane plus 16 gigabytes of DDR4 outperforming just 128 gigabytes of DDR4, right? So that's so correct. I, yeah. Which is pretty shocking. And that, that actually came from uh, Memverge, which is even virtualizing the application. So there's some additional uh, things there. But I think if you... If and this is from look Chris ahead, Rijek, yeah. Like the question yeah, if we about look what ahead, is HBM what? Uh, of course, I'm a memory guy. So the answer is always add more memory, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's always the answer. But uh, I think 
what we're likely to see is uh, one of two possibilities. And I think the one possibility like we were talking about is if Optane memory itself uh, becomes cost effective enough, Hmm. then we start to utilize that uh, a lot more where we're using the SSD. We still have the SSD for kind of our, our capacity storage, but for execution, we're really relying on that Optane memory. Uh, for holding a bulk of information, you know, similar to our example before of kind of a in-memory database, where we'd like to get everything in memory and take care take care of it in that memory bus. So that's the, I think that's the first possibility where we still have, let's call it somewhat limited DRAM, mm-hmm. um, and then we take on all, quite a lot of Optane memory, um, and then we keep uh, kind of a a high capacity and slow SSD for just kind of the, the big backing store mm-hmm. and, and, and going that direction. Um, if Optane persistent memory doesn't make it where mm. it's not really doing that, I think you've just got to go with more memory and you have to go with more exotic types of memory. Mm. Um, whether you can actually use HPM and a gaming platform and have that be, $400, uh, $600, I guess. Yeah, maybe. at the price point, I think that's that's tough, but maybe that's possible because think about it. I mean, as you go from, and we talked about the, the problems with DDR being parallel, but HBM is just massively parallel. Hmm. So, you know, maybe we could do that where there's, we now kind of keep our SSD subsystem the same. Um, we grow the amount of DRAM we have there, but we even add something like HPM in front of that, which is massively mm. parallel, and and get the performance that way. We're still going to be really challenged on how much we can hold in memory, whether HPM or DDR. Um, so that in that case, the SSD also has to be performing very uh, very well to back it up. It can't just be a slow backing store in that case. The SSD is much more active and involved. So I guess those are kind, kind of, of like two, what they're doing two now. Models I can see. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. But I think so, you know, if you think about it, we're saying we've got DRAM and we've got this kind of complex SSD performance SSD. We're either going to in the first case add Optane memory in between DRAM and the SSD and we can slow down and make it a cheaper SSD. Or we have to add very high performance memory in front of the DRAM in something like HPM. Right. Because like I, I think people saw for again, for example, with like the 360 and the PS3, they had half a gigabyte of memory, you know, and then small hard drives. And then they went from half a gigabyte of memory to eight gigabytes. And everyone was like, whoa, but then they still just had a hard drive. And now they've gone from eight to only 16. They've only doubled it. But now the SSDs in both of the next-gen consoles are substantially more capable with dedicated I.O. controllers. You know, so so you're kind of saying if 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 Optane or something like it can get there, probably be more cost effective to maybe instead of going to tons of RAM to just say, okay, well, now we have 32 gigabytes, but now we have a ton of persistent memory because we don't need it. And that'd probably be more cost effective all things considered equal. Otherwise, otherwise they just need to go to a ton of DDR and cash or something. It's kind of what you're saying. Yes. Um, and Tell one other, <laughs> no, no, I think it's right. I think in the one other option here, which is kind of a variation on a theme is, um, there are efforts to come up with high performance NAND, which is not just high capacity NAND. Mm-hmm. Um, Toshiba calls it XL NAND, Samsung calls it Z NAND. That can be combined in your SSD to give you, you know, again, kind of this tiering and give you a high performance tier uh, where the memory technology itself is even much, much faster than what you get from, from standard NAND. Or in some cases, they use this trick of using TLC or QLC NAND, use it as SLC NAND. And to try and squeeze performance out of it. But when you have a dedicated device, and the way those ZNAND and XL NAND devices work is very similar to what we were talking about with H- HBM. It's just a high degree of parallelism. So you light mm-hmm. up a ton of blocks at the same time and just get parallelism. So, yeah. So either a new technology that we insert in between that takes advantage of the memory bus or parallelism, going to some high degree of parallelism, either in the memory, HBM 
or in the SSD itself going to a high degree of parallelism. I mean, those are a couple ideas that that uh, that come to mind. But and then it was always it's probably not just going to be a bigger version of what we have now. They're no. probably going to, you know, which no, is what's it, so funny is I think, you know, people are like, oh, they'll have 100 gigabytes of, you know, it's like, no, no, no. What they're going to do is have an entirely new I.O. system. And yeah, yeah, architecture is going to change. And, you know, here we're even talking about somewhat simple change. What I consider to be simple changes. Straightforward, maybe. Yeah. And I think there's more interesting things going away from von Neumann compute and compute architecture overall. Um, and we see that in the AI field, but that's a, that's a totally different topic, um, in, in architecture. Uh, so, you know, I think there's other ways that these things could go, which give us a completely new paradigm of how, how memory is used in this application. Tick Dickler writes in and says, thanks for getting such an interesting guest. My question is regarding the recent prominence of cash. With AMD and Apple, if I'm not mistaken, it seems like a larger unified cache is at the center of a lot of breakthroughs in performance, but it seems to me like there would have been attempts at something like that in the past. So my question is, is there a reason why larger unified caches are viable now and weren't attempted before or sooner? (laughs) By the way, great name Um, (laughs) to go along with that. Um, I think it. I think it has been attempted multiple times. I think what we're seeing now is um, just on the manufacturing side. So those caches are done in SRAM, and we're seeing some huge, huge chips with SRAM, much bigger than even what we're seeing from AMD. Um, one, one that uh, the oh boy, I'm just drawing a blank on how big that cache is. Let's see if I can remember. There's a there's an AI chip company called Grok. Hmm which is using global foundries and they came out with a chip that's so big it it takes up the whole reticle that we can only do one the company can only well, do one there's, step. I know there's this one called Cerebris um that that's a different, I saw that's oh, okay a different so it's a different one that's that. even okay. different Cerebris is different that's trying to use the whole wafer that's going yeah, back whole to whole wafer integration um so grok is uh for you know it's kind of an ai chip for inferencing but the reason I want to point to him is they're making at Global Founders a chip that's 700 millimeters squared. Mm-hmm. That's an enormous chip, much bigger than a CPU. And Not if bigger I than correctly, NVIDIA graphics cards all the time. <laughs> well, I think, again, chips, yes, true. Uh, well, no, that's still going to be reticle size. You're still going to be limited there. But um, the point I was trying to make is on a chip like this, if I remember correctly, the amount of SRAM is 100 megabytes of SRAM. I mean, just a ridiculous amount of SRAM. Now, they're, they're not using it as a cache. They're using it uh, to drive the, um, the onboard inference engines that they have there. But I think what's happening is the CPU vendors are getting more comfortable with doing much more SRAM on chip. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's why we're seeing some of these much larger caches come along. Um, for a while, you know, like on IBM Power, they did they did EDRAM instead of SRAM. EDRAM mm-hmm. sometimes it was on the SO, sometimes it was on the CPU, sometimes it was a companion chip. You know, Intel's flirted with a companion chip of EDRAM yep. as well. Um, so I think we've seen those efforts, but it's where do we put it? EDRAM has kind of died out because mm-hmm. high density SRAM uh, turns out to be a more economical way and higher performance way. To achieve what you want with a cache, mm-hmm. uh, so so I think those efforts have been there, whether on chip or off chip. Uh, but now the the big big die with lots of SRAM for cache, you know, we, we've seen that at you know whether it's a fourteen nanometer, seven nanometer, going over to to five now. Um, some really interesting uh, cache architectures, but yeah. It, <laughs> Levels of cash kind of, you know, cycle in favor and out of favor. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting question because to me, it's, it's more, I see it that way. This tends to be cyclical. The, I mean, and, and this may be a completely idiotic way to think of it, but how I've kind of seen it is, you know, there's an architecture, they've been working on it, they've optimized it, yep. die shrink exactly it. Right. And then all of a sudden, there's extra space because we die shrinked it. Throw a bunch of cash on, boom! Yeah, performance I think that's right. boost. And, that's and how I see it every I'll time. I'll just add a little is, bit more to you know, that. 
that, hey, we don't want to go back and change our architecture, so let's just throw more memory but, at it. Yeah, get, now that we've Get another right. turn of the crank out of the same architecture. And then you turn the crank and you update the architecture and then you say, ah, I don't need that much cash anymore. Yeah. And to me, that's kind of the way it goes. And that's why we see caches are sort of the adding a bigger cache is what we're saying is sort of the tail end of an architecture. It's sort of the last thing you throw at it to keep it alive before I invest in my next architecture. Yes, I'd agree with that. That's funny you say that too, because you look at Zen 3 and that's the last probably architecture to go on AM4. And yep, that's the final optimization of the initial Zen roadmap before they go to something entirely different with Zen 4. Yeah, it's almost like I don't want to think about architecture anymore. So ah, I'll just throw some more memory at it, make a bigger cache, and we'll get we'll increase our performance and we'll we'll think when it comes to the next turn of the crank. <laughs> Benjamin Cannon writes in and says, with the evolution of 3D stacking on CPUs that are coming quote unquote soon, will we have L1 cache on the CPU that is more than 100 megabytes? No, I think L1 cache is going to stay really really limited he said 100 megabytes right yeah that's yeah that's too large i think l1 cache is so tightly bound um that doesn't make sense to me i think the direction has been to always do more cores and keep our cores relatively simple i think what he's talking about there that's a pretty mega that's that's a massive core if you're having an l1 cache of that size VI Pass writes in and says, with memory capacity and speed increasing, the integration sharing of assets among video cards, RAM, SSDs, on iCache, what are the major bottlenecks between these components? Is it generally the I.O. controllers, bus speed, CPU, or is it software limitations? And then he puts in parentheses, just how bad is Windows holding us back? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know quite how to tackle that one. I think, uh, again, I'm a hardware guy. So from the hardware perspective, you know, we, I think we really hit on what I see and is that uh, the number of memory controllers we have limits us uh, in, in a pretty big way. Um, when I was preparing for a talk I did uh, two months ago, I, I was pretty shocked when I went back and looked. Um, it was interesting, Tom, when you and I were talking, you said, oh, yeah, that's right. And, but for me, it was kind of shocking to look back and see bandwidth per core. And how hmm. poorly we're doing right now. You know, I looked back at DDR. This, this is a Micron. Well, graphics cards haven't been increasing bandwidth nearly, I would argue, fast yeah. enough as they've been increasing teraflops. Yeah. So basically, you know, you look at it and starting in 2003 is when we started putting more cores per CPU. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are we putting now? You know, dozens, up to, in some cases, you know, 100. Yeah. Um, but the number of memory channels, is, is, as we talked about, is kind of limping along. And that's led us to a point where the bandwidth per core is really dipped. And so memory guys are like, hey, we're doing a great thing. We keep, our, you know, we keep our speed going. We keep doubling our speed. But you look at it from a usability standpoint, that, that's a bottleneck. Um, it's often called the memory wall. Um, it's a... You know, I've heard Micron guys insist that that's not really a problem. We are looking at it the wrong way, but well, no, I, I think okay. it's pretty accurate. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a real problem and we need to come up with a, a better way to do it. Um, it. We talked about it already that HBM is kind of a brute force way to do it by just increasing the parallelism while still mm -hmm. using a, a DRAM cell there. Um, there doesn't appear to be any magic memory technology coming that gives us the economics as well as the speed. So we're still kind of, you know, between SRAM, HBM, and DRAM, that's kind of the tools we have to work with right now uh, in, in solving that problem. We, we talked about just a few minutes ago, how much is on-chip versus off-chip. And companies are getting, you know, quite comfortable with doing uh, larger and larger amounts of SRAM on-chip, although the, the keeping the, the thermals in places is a problem. They burn a lot of power in addition to taking a lot of area. So I think we're going to see some innovation um, on SRAM as well. I kind of predict that we're going to see some new technologies come in there that give us a higher density, more efficient SRAM, whether they're faster or slower, I don't know yet. 
but I think it's got to be, you know, we can't have the 8T cell or 12T cells like we have right now for SRAM. They're just taking up too much space. You know, even getting to 6T, uh, pretty hard to do and have a reliable cell. So we've got to have some innovation on SRAM as well. And and I, most memory innovations right now are coming from uh, creative material science, mm. uh, which means tapping more atoms in the periodic table. And doing some interesting things with that, and uh, th- there are some interesting efforts underway that I think we'll we'll even see SRAM itself uh, have some changes because SRAM right now is built with a standard logic process, right? I mean, you don't pay extra for it, mm-hmm. you don't do anything additional. But if we could have something that's much more efficient, uh, I don't know if we'd be an order of magnitude more efficient, but let's say three to four times more efficient in area. Then you could start to tolerate do additional fab processing in the foundry to to do that in order to start thinking about you know moving from low megabytes of SRAM to hundreds of megabytes of SRAM. Maybe someday we'd have gigabytes of something that's not SRAM but on chip memory that gives us that uh, hundreds of picosecond performance, near logic performance. And that kind of gets us to what I think I'll make the final question here as we've been talking for quite a while. And I I see there's some names we haven't specifically called out, but for the most part, I think we've covered the majority, uh, at least touched on our questions, even if they weren't explicitly asked. And when I look at the remaining ones, like Christopher Foster asking about um, theoretical max speeds on current technology, you know, other people ask you know, about like, you know, next gen, a lot of next gen questions. I think I just, the, the final thing I had is I was going to ask you about what's the next 10 years. Let's be honest. We've been talking about what we think's coming in the next 10 years this whole time. But I want to ask kind of a big pie in the sky question of like, let's say next 50 years, like sure. what is the end goal here? Like, you know, we're almost, well, yeah, you've been watching this for like 40 years. And so in 40 years from now, like, what are we really trying to get to? A bazillion tiers, just all cash, like terabytes of cash? That's no I'm gonna take it, Yeah, I'm going to take it in a completely different direction. I mean, what, what I'm personally very excited about is no longer using von Neumann architecture and going into a completely different way. So I've so, done so a So what's talk, von Neumann architecture? Sure. So knows. von Neumann architecture is named after the physicist uh, John von Neumann. Mm-hmm. who uh, has invented or pioneered many things, which we use in our everyday life. He's one of, if you haven't looked him up, please look him up on Wikipedia. You know, he's, he's one of our technology heroes. Um, with, specifically with von Neumann architecture, he's the one that articulated that we have a logical compute unit and we have something for, for storage. You know, that's bifurcated into memory and storage but it's kind of these two basic units and, and that's how we, we program for it, et cetera. Um, von Neumann architecture is very different from our human brain. Mm. Von Neumann architecture is very good at doing calculations. Right. But very poor, limited storage and storage is very high energy, right? We expend a lot of energy. And, and, and so computers are very good at calculation tasks. Human beings are very bad at calculation tasks. Yeah, you know, relative when we're confronted, to them, yeah. When we're confronted by something right away, um, we, we take time to process it. We're, we do have a very small processor as a way to think about it. Mm. We have an amazing memory in our brain. And uh, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. I did a talk on this two years ago. But if we were to take von Neumann architecture and say, let's have it operate with as much memory as a human brain. I can't remember how many gigawatts it is. Oh. But it's a huge amount of power to power the system. And then I'd ask the question, do you know how much power your brain consumes? Oh, I did know. I think a human body uses like usually between 50 and 200 watts when it's not like sprinting or the something, whole, right? That's correct. The whole body is that. The brain is less than 20 watts. And I mm-hmm. gave the talk and somebody shouts out a precise number and I'm like, yeah, you're kind of missing the point here. But it tells us that there's intelligence modeling our own human brain, which is much more power efficient mm-hmm. and, and way more memory 
with less processing. Mm-hmm. How do we get to that model? And and so um, neural nets is an idea. I, I learned about it through the Carver Mead book, um, famous book from the 1980s um, down at Caltech. But neural nets are finally, we're finally getting technology where we can break out of von Neumann architecture and do new things. And so I'm really excited about how we take some of these technologies, including non-volta memory technologies. There's a concept called analog non-volta memory, um, where we use a good old memory array, a NOR array, but we store different states in there and we're not using it for data storage per se. We're using it to store, uh, you know, the, the training that we've done from neural nets and we can make decisions very fast and we can do it at low power. And it turns out we can even use old foundry nodes to compete with things that are at seven or five nanometer. That's very exciting to me because as that research moves forward on new architectures, um, we're not going to think about memory and storage in the same way. We're going to think about synapses Mm -hmm. and we're going to think about how we process information. And so some of that's been called compute in memory. But I think compute and memory in the past has been still using too much of a von Neumann architecture. So how do we break out of that? I don't know what we're going to call it in the future. By the way, if you look up John von Neumann, his uh, research partners claim he got the credit for it because he went to publish before he was supposed to. Mm. (laughs) Um, There's a guy who was at IBM uh, working on this. He actually started by dissecting monkey brains and looking at the the network of the neurons inside. Uh, His name's Dr. Moda. So I don't know if we're going to call it the Moda architecture going forward, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity for radically new architectures that um, much more model our human brain and memory is no longer the way we think about it right now as this discrete unit or storage is a discrete unit. Right. It's much more in, fully integrated with the, the processing, the application and how we're using it. And it's fungible. We can use it for different things. It turns out our synapses in our brain, you know, there's this old model, which we can say is similar to the von Neumann model that certain parts of our brain yeah. do certain I things. I think I know you're going with this. Yeah. That model is very flawed. It yep. actually does not hold up when you do biological testing of human beings. It turns out our, our, there's much greater uh, reuse and we don't have dedicated areas in our brain. Our synapses are very fungible. And, and if you lose like a limb, your the brain, the part of the brain that was selected to compute or control that part of your body that's now gone will be repurposed to enhance other parts. Yeah, we remap. And and a book I'm reading right now is um, this brain theory um, that's that's very radical, that nothing in our brain is really dedicated. And we actually, our brain runs simulations constantly, and then we pick the thing that's closest to our reality. And then that's the one we build on, and we basically error correct on that. Um, that to me that's is why memories can be so flawed, probably then too. Could be, could be. So we don't have uh, we don't have a von Neumann brain. That is for sure. It's compute has has been tremendous. Let's you know over the last uh, 70, 80 years in in advancing the human condition. Uh, but I think the von Neumann architecture only takes us so far. So how do we how do we take architecture in a new way to solve some of these same problems, but do it in a much more energy efficient way? And we're going to get radically different performance out of it. So so that's what excites me. So I did say forty to fifty years. So you did you definitely didn't disappoint in really going for it uh, with what's possible. Um, well, I mean, I think you know we've been talking for two hours. Um, I think we covered pretty much all of the conversation points on there as best as we could. Um, I'm, I think the fans really came out swinging with some good questions, which just yes, they did. Thank listening, you, very much. you know, it really does make the script better. You know, when patrons uh, really put in the effort to well to let us tailor the conversation to what they want us to talk about frankly so hopefully well, and, it benefited and, them too and plus they were very good questions it, it covered a broad area um, it stretched me in terms of uh, both what i've done in my career and and what i i think i know uh, so <laughs> that was a lot of fun yeah i mean i had a, a lot of fun too and um 
<laughs> anything you want to plug on the podcast while I still have you, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, your LinkedIn will be in the notes if that's all right. So people can that's you know, the see best, your history. Yeah, that's the best way to connect with me there. Um, and uh, again, I'm I'm independent consultant. Um, I'm, I am very busy. I've had a couple of very good years of consulting, uh, but always happy to, you know, try and help people out as they learn, uh, especially n- relatively near term about persistent memory and its mm-hmm. applications. Uh, and then if you have some interesting ideas about the uh, future of non von Neumann compute, uh, happy to chat about that. So uh, again, thanks again for the opportunity, Tom. Yep. Thank you for coming on and thank you to everyone for listening. The following podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother, Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, and select technical editing by Carbon Cry. You can find all of our information, including how to get a hold of us, at www.moreslawsdead.com. And if you are a fan and would like to send mail or other hardware, please mail parcels to Moore's Laws Dead, P.O. Box 10468, Peoria, Illinois, 61612. And speaking of fans, without exaggeration, the patrons are responsible for the continued distribution of the content you just listened to. And so if you have some extra money, but only if you do, please consider supporting us. For just $2 a month, you get access to the exclusive podcast, Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to have your questions read aloud on Broken Silicon, Die Shrink, and Loose Ends, and of course, the Moore's Law is Dead Discord, full of like-minded people who would love to meet you. I am one of them. And at higher tiers, you get access to ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the back catalog of Flyover States podcast, thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts and other perks as well. And if you cannot afford to support us, please just share Moore's Law's Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family on social media and Reddit. And give Broken Silicon and Flyover States a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. All of this really does help so much more than I think anyone realizes. If you'd like to advertise on the podcast or a person of interest who would like to be a guest, please reach out to the email address mlhbdead at gmail.com. But as I said, this podcast would not be possible without its fans supporting it. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher producer levels. Matthew McMullen, Telos, GUK, Benny Berlin, Justin Yant, Thomas Rupp, I love you, Lynn and Jim, Ivan K, Joshua Albin, Muhammad al Kawari, Frederick Cloud, James Crasta, Justin Parrish, Zachary Martin, Terrence Herod, Brad Medlin, Phil S, Courtney Elliott, the ninth dude. Greg Renegar, TSPCFS, JBG, Travis Gooding, The Mechanical Philosopher, Lebo Kinkilo, Fatboy Disaru, Daniel Hyde, Dave Kunky, Christoph Novak, Jack O'Neill, Matt Salem, Aaron Close, Juan Garcia, Master Andy Juan, My Name is Nobody, Isaiah Gossner, Lethros, Tellus, Hey There's a Kitty, Greg T. Wanter, Jacob Barber, John Jameson, Benjamin Cannon, Matthew Lane, Joe McMorrow, Jan Rauner, Robert Ducks, Drita Full, Ali Robertson, Eric Jackson, Jonathan, Sean Grant, Evan Dingle, Dominique Cox, Stefan, Original Ross, HardForum.com, Sam MacArthur, Total Silo, Sol Connor, Michael Casa, Andrew S., Blake, Aaron Keith, Kerry Baldino, Endless Loggins, Tom Sanfilippo, Justice Brennan, Ivan K., Trevor Powers, Stu, Elena, Nan Nam, Daniel Nishpal, Franco Frederick, Hardware Numbers, Alex Carastillo, Dark Rain 2049, Leighton Perry, Joseph Caraman, Carlos Valdez, Carnivore Bear, Luca, Zebra Zebra, Zlicky, Martin Porchegi, David Cowden, Ricky Tan, Garanadin, Patrick J.S., Justin Staples, Freddie Canoas Jr., Christopher Foster, Kiwi Phil, Joaquin Hagen, Sarah Light, Anthony Gareffa, Matthew Griffin, Alex, Joseph Loria, Carl Marco, Deke, GZ Raman, Raul Abeneni, Jim Robbins, Jake223, Brian Riggleman, Chris Williams, Ryan Deniskew, Dave McCoy, Valko Malev, Messiers, Paul B., Morton Svensson, Andrew, Thomas Summers, Maurice Courtois, Matthew J. Link, Scott Riff Schneider, My Sharona, Derek File, Roman, Jacob Stan Kiewitsk, Jack Pym, Wakir Khan, Eshil Dare Epstein, Stefan Hart, Christopher A. Butler, Charles Antoine Futo, Peter Moore, Chris Licata, Justin Thomas, Sam Miller, James Kitchens, Kevin Chen, Shakir, Dean Despotsky, Holden Mobley, Matthew Lazier, Arpit Sharma, Luis Correa, Vertical Bar, and Gabe Langnier. And then, of course, thank you to Sahara for the music. 